It has been quite the first couple of weeks regarding the NFL season, and that has led to some wild fantasy football outcomes. Now some teams are sitting at 2-0, and and congratulations because that is entirely skill-based. No luck or variance involved whatsoever. It's only because you spent the entire offseason laboring over every news cycle, reading every beat reporter article, and you now fully understand every single trend in the NFL. You understand how offenses are going to project to the season based off offseason news. You know which teams are going to perform well, which teams are not going to perform well. You are a prediction master, and you're considering quitting your job and moving in to Vegas and gambling full-time for a living. Now, on the other hand, a lot of teams are 0-2, and in that case, well, it couldn't possibly be your fault. Fantasy football is an endeavor that is primarily luck-based and you can't possibly predict injuries that are going to happen or certain drama that occurs between teams. And frankly, the 0-2 start could not possibly be your fault. The process was right, but it's just been the bad side of variance. So for those of us who are unlucky, let's talk about how to get out of the 0-2 hole and return to playoff contention so you can actually have a chance at the title later on in the season. Let's go ahead and cue that intro. Welcome back in to Twin Takes Fantasy Football today, helping out all those fantasy managers that might be in that 0-2 hole. Obviously not a great place to be in as a fantasy football manager, staring down the chamber of an 0-2 start. It might seem like a very laborious task to get back into playoff contention, but I assure you it is not impossible. It's only two games into the NFL season, so please, please don't give up. Take a deep breath because I'm going to share a little insight with you right now. The average wins to reach the playoffs, and I'm going to say this is based off of a team that is a 14-game season, and if what I assume the general consensus is playoffs start in Week 15 and on a three-week playoff over 15, 16, and Week 17, then you the average playoff team to get into the playoffs is eight wins so out of the next 14 games you only need to win eight that is 66 percent win rate that is not impossible for my fellow americans that's not even a c grade if we're going off of our elementary grading system so if you kind of put it in that perspective yes oh and two might not feel great right now but your chances to get into the playoffs and make a run at that championship are not totally out the window. So how do we go ahead and what are the moves that you need to make right now? Well, first off, you need to take inventory of your team. Clearly something has not gone your way, whether it was injury, whether it was a player not performing, whether it was drama, just look at, you know, what's going on in the locker room for the Jets right now, or the Cam Akers incident, something's going on that clearly is detrimental to your team. So you need to identify what the key pieces of the team are that you're going to build around. Ideally, you're going to look to have four pieces. If you don't, if you can't identify four key pieces to build around on your team, you might have bigger fish to fry. But we're going to try to create a core, uh, a core team of four pieces, and then move a lot of pieces outside of that to build depth, to build back um, some names that we think can produce going forward. So, after you've identified your four key pieces going forward, you need to look at your team and identify trends versus variance. And this is very important because variance is something that, you know, we've taken into account with our preseason rankings. We've taken into account with, you know, the ADP of these players, and we expect it to regress towards the mean sooner rather than later. And a trend is something to which, you know, it's looking like it's not going to regress back towards the mean. It's in a downward trajectory, and it doesn't look like it's going to get back up. Some examples of these might be George Kittle. Um, He's an example of variance, in my opinion. This is an offense with the 49ers that we've talked about that has so many offensive pieces with CMC, Debo, Ayuk, Kittle. Even Elijah Mitchell can be utilized. Not this past week, but, you know, we've seen him get touches on the field and just... It's not an offense in which every single one of piece is going to perform each and every week. Kittle is a guy that has been heavily utilized in this offense. We saw down the stretch of 2022 that the Purdy to Kittle connection is a strong one, and he will have weeks where he absolutely explodes for 90 yards and two touchdowns. That, in my opinion, is variance. Not something I think is, you know, a trend downward on Kittle's value. Also, A.J. Brown, you know, he had a strong week one, but this past week, He didn't see a lot of targets. You could see kind of the frustrations boiling over on the sidelines in the middle of the third quarter when he was yelling at Sirianni and Jalen Hurts about how he wasn't involved. Um, But again, similar to the 49ers, this is an Eagles team that has a ton of offensive weapons. 
Devonta Smith is an incredible wide receiver. You have Dallas Goddard, who, you know, he's also a guy that hasn't been involved just yet, but is a very, very talented tight end. You have uh, the plethora of running backs that are going to get a ton of touches, and, you know, they still could be on the uh, in the trading market for acquiring a Cam Akers, Jonathan Taylor, another one of these running backs. Uh, and obviously you have Jalen Hurts, who is a lethal weapon himself um, as a dual threat quarterback. So, I'm not going to worry too much. We saw this even last year where A.J. Brown, he would have some explosive weeks, and then he would go quiet while some of the other options in the offense got some weeks. So I'm not panicking on A.J. Brown after week two. I expect him to regress back towards the mean sooner rather than later. But let's identify some trends that, you know, they're going to get worse, and they might not regress back towards the mean. They might not get better anytime in the near future, and they might be assets that you want to consider moving on from. Clearly, the Bengals are a team that we have to talk about, you know, Week one, it was a weather game. Burrow was coming back from an injury. There was a lot of things to digre- to kind of throw out about that game. But after two games in a row in which they've looked pretty subpar, you have to now kind of ha- raise some red flags around the Bengals offense, especially with the fact that Joe Burrow came out after the game and said he re-aggravated that injury in the calf, and he could be questionable to go on this coming week for week three. Three. Obviously, without Joe Burrow in the offense, you're giving severe downgrades to both Jamar Chase and Joe Mixon. And Joe Burrow in and of himself, if he's dealing with that calf injury, he's not going to be, you know, he was never a great dual threat quarterback, but he was always able to scamper for 20 to 30 yards per game, pick up those additional yards on third down, pick up those additional first downs to keep the drives moving. And without that ability, it's detrimental to both him as a fantasy in fantasy value, as well as, you know, um, on the NFL team, as the defense will have a much easier time corralling him. So with this calf injury, something that has been re-aggravated that we know calf injuries tend to typically take five weeks to completely heal up. It's not an offense that I'm going to think Joe Burrow is going to be accurately commanding and, you know, be completely efficient for at least another five weeks. And that's a, that's a trend down in my opinion. Um, you know, we look at the another AFC North team in the uh, Cleveland Browns. Clearly Deshaun Watson, a lot of people were banking on his bounce back and he's looked pretty rough the first two games if you looked only at the box score and his fantasy points he's put up decent fantasy points you know the rushing touchdown in week one helped him quite a bit and the Browns have managed um the Browns managed to win one and then lose a close game on Monday night to the Steelers but if you actually watch him play you know he looks rusty a lot of his plays you know the pocket breaks down quite quickly when he is out of the pocket. He's not being able to create like the same way we saw him create when he was with the Texans. He just doesn't look like to be the same quarterback he was with the Texans. And I don't know if he's ever going to recapture that magic. So especially with Nick Chubb going down to a season ending knee injury, I expect the offense as a whole to completely regress. And a lot of those options, um, whether it's Amari Cooper, Elijah, uh, a more, I'm just not as high on them. And I think I'm going to be trying to pivot for other options going forward. Uh, finally, another clear and obvious trend down is the Jets. Clearly, with Aaron Rodgers going down um, and Zach Wilson taking over the helm as the quarterback, you're expecting a lot less offensive efficiency. Garrett Wilson's a guy that went from potentially the wide receiver one overall to a guy that's maybe a borderline wide receiver one, wide receiver two, just because of the severe lack of opportunities he's going to get with Zach Wilson and his inability to throw an accurate football down the field and facilitate a aggressive passing offense. So... You know, and that's also going to expand to Brees Hall, to Dalvin Cook, to some of these other options in the offense. Because, you know, if the offense isn't moving and they're hitting these three and outs, if they can't continue to sustain drives, then the opportunity overall for these offensive options is going to be severely limited. So Garrett Wilson is a guy, as much as I love the talent, as much as I was absolutely floored with his touchdown catch on the Monday night game versus the Bills, probably not a great championship piece for a fantasy football team. So, again... Those are some examples, but you're going to want to go through and identify those trends that may not be, you know, something that's going to bounce back quickly versus variance, which is something that will bounce back quickly and be fantasy relevant. Um, After that, you're going to have to throw draft capital out the window because now we're looking to make trades. We're now looking to, you know, build around those core four players and start developing a roster because, like I said in the beginning, something's happened. Either the players are underperforming. The you've been hit by the injury bug. Players are sitting out due to drama. Um, So you got to build up. You got to build up that depth. And at this point, after two weeks, you have to throw draft capital out the window. It means nothing anymore for those players that you target at the top. You know, you could probably still make some moves. So 
with being only a couple weeks removed from the draft, the draft capital is still pretty prevalent in people's minds. It's not completely destroyed, but you're kind of in that sweet spot where if you've identified these trends, trade these players that are still kind of riding that high of their name value or riding the high of a, a second, third, fourth round ADP and try to actually move them for players with genuine production. Some examples that I would like to give you is um, I'm moving Jahan Dotson, a guy that was a sixth, seventh round pick. I'm trading him for Kyron Williams. Um, not to say that I'm completely out on Jahan Dotson, but you know this is a very neophyte uh, quarterback in Sam Howell, who's going to take a lot of time, even with Eric Bieniemy, um, showing great prowess in his first two games as the offensive coordinator for the Commanders. It's going to be a while for this offense to really hit its stride. Jahan Dotson just hasn't been productive the first two weeks, and not saying he he couldn't be a fantasy winner in you know the second half of the season. But right now, if you're an own two, you need production. You need guys that are that are going to work for you right now. Kyron Williams with the Cam Akers drama is a guy that I think you know. Harkening back to the way Sean McVay uses running backs, we've seen it with Darrell Henderson before. We've seen it with Cam Akers at the end of last season. We've seen it with Todd Gurley as the most prevalent example. Kyron Williams is a guy that's going to be very, very valuable for fantasy. A guy that a lot of people picked up off of waivers. And if you're going to trade a guy like Jahan Dotson, maybe you get someone to bite and give you Kyron Williams. Um, Mike Williams, another wide receiver that you know used the name value of Mike Williams and the the ties to the Charger offense, the Kellen Moore bump, the Justin Herbert, you know, maybe you can entice someone to trading Kyron Williams for Mike Williams. But I think if you were able to move off of Mike Williams and get Kyron Williams, that's an upgrade in my opinion. I mean, even something that's really, really spicy as a one for one, Joe Mixon, a guy who had a fourth round ADP. We talked about trends earlier. I'm kind of souring on the Bengals as a whole, given the Joe Burrow injury saga. And if you listen to this podcast prior to the season, you probably won't have Joe Mixon on your team as he was a guy I was definitely not high on. That seems to have come true throughout the first two weeks of the season. But hey, there are people who love Joe Mixon. They love that he's attached to the Bengals offense and they're still looking at 2021 and 2022 with rose-colored glasses. If you can trade Mixon for Kyron, that is a move I would make. Um, Some other options outside of just, you know, completely going head over heels for Kyron Williams, you know, Saquon Barkley, a guy that this is going to transition really nicely into our next point, but guys that are going to be injured, the guys that are not going to con- contribute to your team at this moment, you need to move off them right now. You need uh, initial value production and you need to maybe sell them at 75% of their total value. Um, so moving off of guys that are not going to com- not going to contribute to your team. Saquon, obviously, Brian Dable came out and said he's a game-time decision for this coming week. I genuinely don't believe that report. I think he is going to be out for three weeks with this, you know, grade two ankle sprain. I would be trading Saquon Barkley for Calvin Ridley. While, yes, that's a clear downgrade in a lot of people's minds, especially after his monster week against the Arizona Cardinals, you're going to need someone to complete to come in and score you points over the next three weeks. These next three to four weeks are crucial. And if Saquon's sitting in your IR spot, he cannot contribute it's just, it's a frustrating situation, but you need guys that are going to come in. So Saquon for Calvin Ridley is a move that I would do as well. So also, again, with the potential of an injury, you know, with the Nick Chubb, with um, J.K. Dobbins, you know, a lot of guys have sustained injuries, you know, to a surprising amount through the first couple games of the season. So you're going to need to build up depth. We've, you know, established those core four players that we want to build around. But it's not four players are going to win you a championship. You need the start eight, the start nines. So you're going to take some of that top end talent and try to transition it into depth. Some moves that I would be doing is, you know, I hate to harp on the Bengals here, but if you are in an 0-2 situation, which you probably could be in if you drafted Jamar Chase in the top three, um, he hasn't really put up a ton of points this past um, couple weeks. I think he's totaled 12 points over the first two games of the season, which is absolutely abysmal. So, I'm going to try to trade Jamar Chase just because I don't think that situation is going to get better for another five weeks or so and try to pick up some wide receiver and running back depth. Some examples of trades I would would make at this moment. Trading Jamar Chase for Rashad White and Marquise Brown. Players attached to abysmal offenses, but they have put up production. Those are guys that come in and, you know, build out some depth in your team. Trading Jamar Chase for Miles Sanders and a Michael Pittman. Um... You know, Miles Sanders hasn't been really productive. Um, I have concerns around Miles Sanders, and we'll talk about that later, especially with the teams that I have Miles Sanders on, um, obviously attached to an inexperienced offense. Um, 
A lot of things to talk about with a rookie quarterback-led offense. But again, you know, we expect development from rookies as the season goes on. Hopefully, Miles Sanders can continue to break out just because he's had a couple rough matchups for the first two games of the season. And Michael Pittman, you know, we've talked about Anthony Richardson. Even with the concussion in, uh, issues with Anthony Richardson, he's not as raw as we initially anticipated him coming into this season. He's made some good plays, have been able to facilitate a decent passing offense, and even if it is Gardner Minshew, he's one of the better backups in the NFL. Uh, so Michael Pittman as the wide receiver one of that offense I think is a great value right now. I'd also be willing to trade Jamar Chase for James Conner and Nico Collins. Uh, again, when we talked about James Conner, uh, he was one of my starts for the week at the running back position. Again, just gets elite usage in that Arizona Cardinals offense. And Nico Collins, you know, looks to be the guy um, in the Houston offense. And again, it is nerve wracking trading for pieces in an offense that are led by rookie QBs. But we'll talk about how, you know, you sometimes when is the right time to target QB rookies, um, whether it's a QB roulette offense, whether it's a running back, whether it's a wide receiver. Um because it just takes time to ramp up throughout um, throughout the season. And the first few games are going to look rough. Not every rookie comes out and looks absolutely stunning. Cough, cough, Zay Flowers. We can't all be Zay Flowers. Um, so, uh, so reiterate this point. Move off of some of those really high-end players that you, you know, identified. You know, this is like a Saquon, a Jamar Chase. Um and try to build up that depth with players that maybe not don't have that high level ceiling, but you know, they're going to give you immediate production. Um, and I understand it's going to be painful to make these moves, trading away Jamar chase for guys that had sixth, seventh, eighth round draft capital. That's painful. You might look at me like, and I'm an idiot, but you know, you have to give up the high end talent. You have to give up that upside. Jamar chase will come back. He will have games where he's the wide receiver five on a week or higher. But you need to make a push now and you need to have talent that's going to contribute now. So you're giving up that really, really high end for pieces that are going to really round out your team. Um, and especially when it comes to waiting, you can no longer wait around on risks. Um, some of these players you took um, at the top end of your drafts, you were taking a risk on Cooper Cup with the hamstring injury. You're taking a risk on Jonathan Taylor you know, with the contract issues and being put on the PUP list to start um, the season. Those are risks that, you know, if your team cracked right, you could wait on those risks and hopefully, you know, capitalize on them later in the season. But that risk has not paid off. You need to move off of them because they're still not guys that are going to contribute. Um, because right now, an 0-2 hole is something you can come back from. An 0-4 hole, that's almost a death sentence in fantasy. So you need to move off of them. You need to be okay taking 75 cents, 70 cents on the dollar. Um and just moving on to try to make, you know, try to get back to 500 by week four. Then you can reevaluate and then try to capitalize on some depth pieces um, later on down the season. But you need to, these next couple weeks are crucial to win. So, again, we've talked about the Bengals ad nauseum in this video. You know, it's not going to be the offense, especially Joe Burrow's calf injury. I would be moving off of those players to try to get cap capital. We talked about, you know, with the trades I do with Jamar Chase, Cooper Cup. He's out for at least two more games being on the PUP list. That's four games. He could come back in week five, but what the reports that I've read, most likely he's out for eight games with that hamstring injury. So, you know, best case scenario, you don't have him for the next two games. And if you're sitting at 0-4, that's basically a death sentence. You cannot wait on that risk. Jonathan Taylor, he may never suit up for the Colts again um, this season. Uh, he may not, never suit up for the Colts again. He may never suit up for the NFL. In fact, this season, if a trade never materializes. But again, best case scenario being on the PUP list, he is out two more games. And you cannot have him sitting on your bench gathering dust, contributing nothing to your fantasy team. Because if you are 0-4, like I said, 0-2, you can come back from 0-4. That is a death sentence. Saquon Barkley, Aaron Jones, David Montgomery, even to a degree. These are guys that are all projected to be out at least three more games. You got to move off of them because you need you need to get back into the fray. You need to get back into a comp, uh, competitive team that's crouching back towards 500 in the next two weeks. Um so we've talked about trades. We've talked about moves that you can do with your existing team. But now you have to also become a waiver wire expert. Um, because again, there's a lot of players that you can get off of waivers that are going to win you leagues. Amon Ross St. Brown was a waiver wire wonder. Rashad Penny a couple years ago. Uh, Jarek McKinnon last year was a guy that won a lot of people leagues coming off the waiver wire. There's a lot of value to be had because 
teams, leagues are not one at the draft. They are one with waiver wire moves and continually to actively manage your team. So this is why it's important not to give up on your team and to continue to make moves um, and adjust. So if you're here, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're listening to other fantasy podcasts, getting their advice, you know, fantasy footballers, fantasy pros, listening to what they say as far as um, – waiver wire pickups and guys that you should look for that to contribute going forward, you're already doing the right thing. You're trying to gather information and that's what you need to do on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you need to gather information uh, to make informed decisions about the waiver wires uh, and making key pickups each and every week. Um, with injuries and player news this week, just because of how many injuries that were sustained, um, it's going to be big for waivers. So um, obviously if you're watching this, in next week, if you're in an 0-3 hole, I think you can still climb out of that as well. Obviously, this information won't be as prevalent because a lot of these players might be gone. But for week two, it's guys like Jerome Ford. I'm using over 50% of my fab to go pick up Jerome Ford um, because a running back one, especially in a Kevin Svansky team, is always very valuable. Kyron Williams probably is not on your waiver wire, but if he is, I'd be throwing 100% of my fab at Kyron Williams to pick him up. Puka Nakua, also probably not on your waiver wire, but if he is, go grab him. Nico Collins, a guy that I really like um, as a wide receiver uh, free agent pickup for the Houston Texans. Um, I would definitely be throwing, you know, a good chunk, 30 to 40% of my fab to go pick up Nico Collins. Um, but even if you get through that first initial waiver report, a lot of people's waivers runs early at like 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Even if you get through that, don't stop paying attention to waivers. Look at who people are dropping because sometimes people need win now moves and they drop players who are injured. There are sometimes some some very valuable finds that you can pick up on waivers. I remember in one league last year, I know this is probably not a commonality, but um, someone dropped Cam Akers when he was going through that whole inactive stint last year. Um, and then if you picked him up off waivers after uh, someone dropped him, well, you know, you're awarded with a fantasy championship run towards the end of the 2022 season. So, um, pay attention to players who are dropped. Also continue to listen to reports throughout the week. Um, again, I would recommend sleeper HQ, um, download the sleeper app, uh, for my experience and my money, they tend to have the most, they tend to report fantasy news the fastest because, um, normally if I look at my phone and I have notifications, sleepers, number one. ESPN's number two, then ESPN Fantasy is honestly pretty slow. It comes out even after both of those. So if you even have notifications set up to the fantasy football alerts on Sleeper, you're going to be ahead of most of your league mates who don't have that app. Even if you're not using the Sleeper leagues, their alerts, I think, are the quickest um, market information that you can get. Um, and they also report the most fantasy news that they'll let you know, like, hey, listen, this is a minor fantasy football issue. But, you know, even some of the more minor injuries or the minor camp camp reports or, you know, even some things that might appear minimal, they're going to report it and push out a notification to your phone. So, you know, it, again, it helps with gathering that information so you're not scouring Twitter or X or the web or the Internet looking for information. Um, but once you get this news, it's important to react quickly, even if it's just um, – a hint of information. I remember two uh, two years ago, during when COVID was a big thing, there was a report that came out that Austin Eckler. This was like in also the semi uh, final week as well. I think it was week fifteen or sixteen uh, that Austin Eckler potentially was going to miss um, due to COVID. He wasn't progressing through the COVID. Um, verification process as quickly as you normally thought and he could have missed that week so even without the confirmation that Austin Eckler was out I went ahead and picked up Justin Jackson which proved to be a very fruitful move because on and I did that on like a Tuesday or Wednesday come Friday um Austin Eckler was did not pass COVID protocols he was ruled out Justin Jackson actually went off and had 30 points that week so you know Sometimes these moves pay off. Sometimes these don't move. These moves don't pay off. But when you hear like an inkling of something, hey, this guy tweaked something. He might be out on a Wednesday. Hey, this guy, you know, in concussion protocol, react quickly, even if it doesn't pay off. You know, on the slight chance that they don't pass concussion protocol or they're ruled out for that game, kind of similar to a Christian Watson who was a late injury ad um, in Week One for the Green Bay Packers. You know, you're gonna be able to pick up a guy um, before that news hits the mainstream media outlets. Um, and also, even after Friday practice through walkthroughs, for whatever reason, and maybe this is just a narrative thing in my mind, Sunday morning is like really one of the biggest news cycles. You get late game inactives. You get, I mean, this past week, maybe 
um, I'm recency bias here, but you know, you got the Cam Akers news right before the game started on Sunday. There's just a lot of things that seem to come out Sunday morning pertaining to fantasy football and updates regarding players' availability, injury status, and whatnot. So I know it might be hard, especially if you love the nightlife on Saturday, but wake up early Sunday morning, pay attention, be ready to make active moves um, on your team, even if it's just a stash. I remember last season, um, there was... Uh, some injury concerns around DeAndre Swift in week two. So I picked up Jamal Williams on Sunday morning, stashed him, and then obviously, you know, he re-aggravated that injury in the game, and Jamal Williams became a great fantasy asset going forward. So the last point I want to talk about right now is investing in rookies. And investing in rookies can be really, really tricky because historically, rookies aren't immediate impacts uh players to their respective NFL offenses, whether they're a wide receiver, whether they're running back, whether they're a quarterback, it genuinely takes time to adjust to the NFL play speed um, and become ingrained in their respective offenses. Shout out Zay Flowers, who is an outlier in every which way or form and is making me eat a lot of crow on my earlier takes this past offseason. But um, I'm willing to accept that because I love Zay Flowers. I think he's an incredible asset. If you drafted him, congratulations, you have won fantasy. Um, But guys that you know, you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. Let's talk about the quarterback position first. CJ Stroud and Bryce Young. I don't think they're going to be impactful for fantasy. I don't see them starting week in, week out on your fantasy team. I'm not targeting them on the waivers, but you have to understand their impact on their respective offenses. Now, historically, offenses led by rookies have been pretty putrid for fantasy football, especially when it comes to wide receiver options and running back options, just options all around. Um, and we've seen that. I mean, I thought Miles Sanders was the guy that was going to be quarterback agnostic just with how, you know, much volume he was going to get with his passing game utilization. But he has certainly been at the receiving end of an inefficient offense led by a rookie quarterback. CJ Stroud's first game was pretty putrid. And, you know, we've seen Damian Pierce really, really struggle um, as a running back tied to a rookie quarterback. However, um, it's important to pay attention to these rookies. And this kind of flies in the face of what I said earlier, because like right now I'm looking um, the waivers I'm making right now are immediate impact players, players that I really want to um, contribute right now. But we also want to make sure that we're waiver paying, being waiver wire experts um, as the season continues. And there's guys that I want to pay attention to, especially rookies. We look at some of these younger players that break out um, – and they become league winners. Look at Amon Ross St. Brown. Look at Justin Jefferson. Um, these are guys that, you know, Amon Ross didn't break out until week eight, week nine of the season. Justin Jefferson really wasn't utilized until week six of his rookie season. So, you know, the first couple games, you kind of take it with a grain of salt because they're still getting incorporated to these NFL offenses. Guys that I think, you know, not impactful right now, but I, whoops, definitely want to pay attention to because they might become league winners down the line. Quentin Johnston for the Los Angeles Chargers. Obviously, he only had one reception in each of the first two games, but this is a team in the Chargers that has been very familiar with the injury bug. We've seen Austin Eckler already miss one game, and Mike Williams struggle with injuries as well. Um, So we look for, historically, rookies become more involved with the offense after the bye week. So Quentin Johnston, maybe during the bye week, is a guy I look to go acquire then. Uh, For running backs, Kendry Miller... um, for the Saints, I mean, hopefully Kendra Miller can find a way to get healthy quickly because if he does, I think he can be a massive impact for fantasy football um, towards the latter half of the season. We saw Jamal Williams walk off the field with an injury on Monday night. I don't have a lot of faith in Tony Jones Jr. And Alvin Kamara, even when he comes back, we saw last season his efficiency dramas- dramatically decreased. Zach Charbonnet for the Seattle Seahawks, a guy that's been really... Um, Hasn't really heavily been used in the first couple of games, but I think that's going to change pretty soon. Kenneth Walker, as much as he had a great fantasy game in week two, probably 17 or 18 points, depending on your league format, but that was entirely dependent on scoring two touchdowns. When it came to actually running the ball, he was wildly inefficient. I think it was like 14 carries for 37 yards or something like that. So, you know, as the season progresses, you could see Zach Charbonnet come in um, and take over a lot of that goal line work from him, take over some of that passing down work and really usurp Kenneth Walker as the running down as the running back for um, the Seattle Seahawks, which has obviously been a very valuable position for fantasy uh, in the past. And two guys that I want to mention whose um, breakout later on the season could be exponential because not only are they rookies in and of themselves, but their quarterbacks are rookies. And that is Jonathan Mingo and Tank Dell. Jonathan Mingo has had an okay start to his season. Tank Dell has had a little bit better start of his season. He may be on your waiver wire right now, but you know we're looking at, rookies incorporated into the offense and that's you know if your quarterback is a rookie 
and your wide receiver is a rookie, well, they both have a ramp up period. So instead of this kind of linear uh, ramp up curve, it's going to be this exponential ramp up curve. So we're looking at guys that I think, you know, could come in second half of the season. Adam Thielen never has been the picture of health. Not really a lot of other wide receiver options that excite me uh, with the Houston Texans. So as CJ and Bryce continue to develop and as Tank and Jonathan Mingo get more acclimated to the to the game speed of the NFL. I think these are guys that could absolutely be impactful um, later on in the season. So while we've you know talked about moves to make right now to bolster your winning team, to bolster your wins and bolster your team depth uh, to contribute with fantasy points right now, these, especially when it's these rookies, keep in mind and try to be, you know, one or two weeks ahead of them. You know, the bye week is a really good indicator of when to start picking up rookies um, because they can definitely be impactful if you need some extra depth going into the latter half of the season. So let's combine everything we've talked about today. We're going to apply this to one of my teams, which, you know, clearly not my fault, uh, entirely unlucky, entirely um, based upon factors out of my control. And it's just been the wrong side of variance. So I'm going to look at trends and two players that I want to identify. Um, I know I just talked to Miles Sanders as the guy that, you know, could break out a little bit further down the season. Um, he could break up, could break out a little bit further down the season with um, Bryce Young's ascension in the NFL. But right now, historically, we look at trends, and that trend is that running backs in offenses led by rookie quarterbacks just don't produce for fantasy. So I'm looking to move off Miles Sanders, but he's a guy that still carries a lot of name value. Um, and Stephon Diggs, a guy that's near and dear to my heart, a guy that I have, you know, really loved fantasy football. But it seems that you know. This Buffalo Bills offense. I do have a lot of good wide receivers in this league. I have C.D. Lamb, who I want to really content build my wide receiver room around. So I'm willing to move off of Stephon Diggs. Um, you're going to have to give up big name players. Well, I don't think Stephon Diggs is an absolute travesty for fantasy football. I actually like his uh, um, rest of the season outlook more than Jamar Chase. Um, but Stephon Diggs is a guy that you know we've seen a lot more weapons added to this offense. We've seen James Cook get involved in the past game. Dalton Kincaid is slotted in immediately as a pass catching option. Gabe Davis got a ton of targets tied with Stefan Diggs for targets. So I don't think he's going to have that insane high utilization that he's had uh, last season and two seasons ago with over 140 plus targets. So CD was a guy on my team that I wanted to build my wide receiver room around as my wide receiver one. So Stefan Diggs is the guy I'm willing to move off of. So I'm packaging Stefan Diggs and Miles Sanders for two rookies, Jameer Gibbs and Jordan Addison. Jameer Gibbs, I think, you know, going to continue to break out. It hasn't been looked great for him the first two weeks, but with the David Montgomery injury and obviously with him getting continuing to be incorporated into this offense, I expect him to have a massive rest of season performance. And Jordan Addison, you know, we talked about this in my pre-game pre prediction on Thursday night. Really big fan of what Jordan Addison has been able to do coming directly into the league, lining up across from Justin Jefferson. Um, and even we saw, despite a decent fantasy performance on Thursday night, you know, still wasn't out there for more snaps than KJ Osborne, still had a lot to learn in this offense, and he still was great for fantasy. So as he continues to learn this offense and get incorporated into this offense, I think the sky's the limit for Jordan Addison. So that would be, you know, and some people might say it's crazy trading Diggs and Sanders for Gibbs and Addison. But that's a move that I'm making right now to hopefully bounce back from my own to start. So take a deep breath, guys. I know it's frustrating. Fantasy football has taken years off my life. I get it. But 0-2 is not a death sentence. Try to follow these leagues. If you have any questions, leave them down below. If you found these tips helpful, again, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, again, it's been you know, a wild fantasy football season, and I'm going to be here to help you talk through it with some advice videos like this one. But again, take a breath. Look forward to week three, reset your lineup, and uh, good luck. Hope you guys win, and I'll see you around next time. Take care.